When it comes to groups of bad guys making their mark on a story, no group has ever made more of a mark than the Akatsuki. In fact, if you ask 10 Naruto fans who their favorite character from Naruto is, I guarantee you at least five of them say one of the members of the Akatsuki. And while Itachi does skew those numbers a little bit, he's still a member of the Akatsuki. And that's because the Akatsuki were incredible. Their character design, their backstories, their individual powers all made them unique and interesting characters. And while some of the members of the Akatsuki were a lot cooler than other members of the Akatsuki, really even the most minor members of the Akatsuki left a longer and larger lasting impression impression than most villains from other anime. But just because they left an impression on us does not mean they were good people, or that they were correct in their worldview, or even deserved to live. Which is probably why every single member of the Akatsuki eventually dies. But I mean, they are the bad guys after all, their job is to die. Right? They scream their values at the main character who screams their values back at them louder. They fight and then some other side character finishes the job so Naruto doesn't get his pearly white gloves dirty. But what if all the members of the Akatsuki didn't die? What if instead they all realized the error of their ways and committed the rest of their lives to fixing the wrongs that they had done in the Akatsuki? Well, I know that may not sound like a possibility for the majority of the Akatsuki because a lot of them were evil to their core. What's beautiful about the Akatsuki and probably why people are still obsessed with them to this day is because even though they were evil, each and every single one of them had a singular motivation unique to them. Every single member of the Akatsuki had wants and dreams, people they loved, and motivations outside of the confines of the Eye of the Moon plan. And if they just leaned into those motivations, they could have achieved their happy endings. But obviously, they didn't do that. Whether it be consensually or through force, every single one of the members of the Akatsuki joined up and tried to make the Eye of the Moon plan a reality. However, because they were all essentially trying to end the world, they would all meet their end in the pursuit of the conclusion of the Eye of the Moon plan. But today, we're going to be rewriting their stories, just to change that last little bit. See, today, I want to write a happy ending for every single member of the Akatsuki. An ending that takes them away from their life as an Akatsuki member and allows them to live out their days doing what they love most. But at the same time, I also want to give them an ending that makes sense within the confines of the plot and makes sense for them as a character. I'm not going to say that Hidan started a kitten farm and is now the chillest dude around, which is why today we're undertaking the grandiose goal of giving the Akatsuki a happy ending. And I'm not talking about the Robert Kraft kind of happy ending. I only got two hands and there's nine of them. But before we make our way to Jupiter, Florida, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you like the idea of anime content so good that it feels like a happy ending every time you're watching it, then you're gonna love my other channel, The Weep Commander, where instead of talking about Naruto and Boruto, I talk all other anime. And if you want whatever the reverse of a happy ending is, go ahead and follow my anime podcast, Sudaku's Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime and manga this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And there truly is no happier ending than buying something that you love, which is why you should meander your way on over into my merch store, TakuzAnonymous.net, where you can pick up some of the greatest anime t-shirts, sweatshirts, and sticker packs known to man. Now, per usual, there's really no way to go about starting these videos. I guess I could go through the members of the Akatsuki in terms of their strength rating. I could go alphabetic. Or I could just pick their names out of a hat. But to me, the best way that we can go through this list of Akatsuki members is in the chronological order in which they die. Which means we're going to be starting with Saucery, who dies in episode 27 of Naruto Shippuden. He did not have a long run. In order to understand the happy ending we're going to be trying to give Saucery and really any of the Akatsuki members, we're going to have to understand what their core motivation was. What drove them outside of the Eye of the Moon plan. And for Saucery, his core motivation in life was to assuage the loneliness that he felt through the loss of his parents and his best friend, all of which he turned into puppets because puppets A, cannot die, and B, are under his control. And thus, all Saucery genuinely wanted was a place to belong. Now, while that place did eventually end up being the Akatsuki, this doesn't mean that Saucery was fundamentally a bad person. In fact, when it comes down to members of the Akatsuki, he's one of the more redeemable ones. And thus, the ending that I would write for Saucery wouldn't have his parent puppets puncturing his core, but rather simply stabbing through his puppet body which as we all know, isn't enough to kill Saucery because the only way you can injure Saucery is by killing the core inside of his puppet. However, as his mother and father puppets stand there by his side, Saucery is reminded of their embrace and how much they meant to him while he was still alive and how he owed the happiness of these moments to the sand, the village in which he grew up. And it's at this point that Saucery realizes that the person responsible for making sure that little boys and their families, like Saucery and his family, will continue to grow up happy and safe in the sand 
is Gara, current Kazekage, a person that Sasori and Daedara killed and extracted Chukaku from. So Sasori, after feeling the embrace of his parents once again, apologizes to Granichia, the only other person on Earth who inarguably struggled as much with the death of Sasori's parents as he did. And after apologizing to her, he shambles over to Gara's corpse and uses the one's own life jutsu, a jutsu that Sasori secretly watched Granichiu formulate over the years. And as he's channeling his life force into Gara and the jutsu is near complete, his vision begins to tunnel, and at the end of that tunnel, he sees his parents. However, as his vision begins to blur, he feels hands on his back, and life force funneling into him, as his vision begins to broaden once again, and his parents begin to disappear. And as he turns around, he sees Granny Chio, the last remaining vestiges of his family, giving her life to save his. And once she's successful in doing so, both Saucery and Gara are alive and they're able to thank Granichio before she passes. After this, Saucery returns to the sand where he atones for his crimes by sharing the knowledge that he's gained about puppets over the course of the last couple of decades with the hidden sand, making the puppeteers of the sand and the sand by extension much more powerful. He then returns the puppet or the body of the third Kaze Kage so that it can get a proper burial within the sand and he becomes Konkuro Sensei with whom he finds family once again in the hidden sand. After Sasori, we have Yidan, who was inarguably the most irredeemable out of all of the members of the Akatsuki. But don't worry, we'll get there. Hidan dies in a battle against Shikamaru. Well, I guess dies isn't the right word. Hidan gets turned into mincemeat in a battle against Shikamaru. As Shikamaru binds hundreds of paper bombs to Hidan's body that he sets off with Asuma's lighter. And Hidan's body and thousands of pieces falls into a hole that Shikamaru covers with dirt, which felt fair for a man who killed Asuma and hundreds if not thousands of other people. And thus, I wouldn't change that at all. But what I would do is a couple of years after Hidan's explosion, I would cut back to him in the hole. I would do a time lapse of Hidan slipping in and out of insanity as he tries to munch his way out of a hole using only his teeth. And as he battles against his own sanity, Hidan eventually comes to peace with the fact that he imparted an insane amount of violence onto the world. And as he comes to peace with this fact, he realizes that the idea of Lord Joshin was actually just a figment of his imagination. An entity he made up in a moment of hysterical insanity to help explain why he was immortal when nobody else wasn't. And that he made the rules of Joshinism so he could inflict harm on those around him. Because within the confines of the Land of Hot Water, he was an outcast who was blamed for the murder of the Shinoiki clan, simply because he was the weird kid who stumbled upon a clan-wide massacre. And thus, after years of biting at dirt and spitting it out of his neck hole, Hidan eventually manages to free his head, which allows him to slowly but surely begin to regenerate and make his way to Konoha, where he is very not welcomed. But the reason he goes to Konoha is in order to pay the debts for the damages he feels as though he incurred onto them, and therefore he commits his life to be used as a soldier for Konoha, preferably as a member of the Anbu. An Anbu member who would be able to inflict harm on Konoha's enemies with no risk of dying, and thus he could become Konoha's perfect soldier. And therefore, Hidan pays his debts to society by toiling away as one of Konoha's secret Anbu members, who still gets the kill, but only the bad guys. Next up after Hidan, we have his partner. Kakazu, who dies at the hands of Kakashi because Naruto really just couldn't dirty his hands to finish the job. Hey Naruto, you hit him with a Rasen shuriken that cut him on a molecular level and destroyed three of his hearts. Do the right thing and finish him off. Kakazu's core motivation was cold hard cash. But a lot of people don't understand why Kakazu was so obsessed with money. See, Kakazu wanted money because money is the one thing that transcends both time and loyalty. And since Kakazu is effectively immortal and was cast out of his village for not being able to defeat one of the strongest ninjas in ninja history, knew he needed something that would last him forever and would never stab him in the back. And thus, money filled that gap. And thus in my rewriting, just before Kakashi is about to plunge his Raikiri into Kakazu's last heart, Kakazu screams, wait, I have information that I'm willing to sell you. Information about the Akatsuki and considering our current predicament, I'm willing to give you a pretty good price on it. And thus Kakazu is brought to Konoha for questioning where he's interrogated by a Yamanaka who simply just takes the intel. They can do that. They just hop into your brain and get all your information. But while that Yamanaka clansman is in Kakuzu's mind, he realizes that Kakuzu only joined the Akatsuki, one, for money, and two, because he believed 
it would never stab him in the back, or that he could stab them in the back long before they would ever get the chance. In essence, the Yamanaka clansman realizes that Kaksu just didn't want to be thrown out like trash, like the hidden waterfall did to him almost a hundred years ago. And thus, once the interrogation is done and the Yamanaka clansman conveys the knowledge the Kakazu has about the Akatsuki to the higher-ups in Konoha, they go to Kakazu and ask, do you want to make some money? At which point they reveal to him how the mission pay system works in Konoha, with S-rank missions paying out millions of Ryu. And they point out the fact that multiple members of the Akatsuki exist on the bingo book, with prices tied to their heads. And thus Kakazu is brought in as a mercenary-esque shinobi, tasked with taking down the most dangerous and most expensive members of the bingo book. After Kakazu, we have Deidara, who blows himself up in the perfect expression of his art that was his C0, a technique that was supposed to kill Sasuke. And while I might sound a little bit silly here, I think that actually might have been Deidara's happy ending. I mean, Deidara's core motivations is that explosions are artwork. They're ephemeral, massive, and beautiful to him. Whether it be his C1 through his C4, he was enthralled by every explosion he ever created. No explosion was he more excited for than his C0. And this is backed up by the fact that even after Deidara is brought back to life throughout a Tensei, he refuses to do his C0 ever again, as he believes replicating the C0 explosion would cheapen his final explosion, the ultimate expression of his art. And while sure, that was convenient convenient plot right around because Kishimoto didn't want Deidara ending the story right then and there, it does speak to his character at least a little bit. And therefore, if I was truly going to give Deidara his happy ending, I would say he would still do his C-Zero explosion, but this time it would just actually kill Sasuke. After Deidara, ironically, we have the person who recruited Deidara into the Akatsuki, Tachi, who probably deserves a happy ending more than anybody else on this list. However, unfortunately, also probably had the most necessary death out of anybody on this list. And therefore, finding a way in which Itachi doesn't die, that doesn't destroy the plot, is a bit tough. See, Itachi meets his end at the consequence of an illness racking his body, and quite literally, nothing else. Oh, no, 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 I am sorry. Also MS over usage. And that's it. And thus at the end of the, I guess if you want to call it a fight that he's having against Sasuke, Itachi kicks it. So that Sasuke can take Itachi's eyes and awaken the EMS. And thus that brings us to the necessity that is Itachi's death. Because if Itachi doesn't die, Sasuke never gets EMS. At least if you don't consider all your options. And I'm not gonna say that Itachi's happy ending is him killing Sasuke and taking his EMS and then taking Sasuke's spot. That wouldn't be a happy ending for Itachi. That would actually be the worst possible scenario. No, instead, what I would do is that I would have the fight end the way that it does. However, instead of dying while poking Sasuke's forehead, Itachi instead says, he has our father's eyes, referring to Obito and his Sharingan collection. But before Itachi falls to the ground, he dismisses his Susano and uses the small amount of chakra he has left to cast Izanagi. And while the Izanagi is short, because one, he's short on chakra, and two, he doesn't have both Indra and Ashura's DNA, it's long enough for him to make himself a body free of his illness. Now in this new illness-free body, one of Itachi's eyes goes blind. And before Itachi collapses from chakra over usage, he says, now, he can't use my eyes any longer. And then he collapses. And as Obito appears above the collapsed Itachi to finish the job, Sasuke yells, wait, I have questions for him. And thus they return to Obito's lair, where Itachi's final words ring off in Sasuke's head. And Sasuke thinks, was Obito there that night? And when Obito goes to steal the now unconscious Itachi's eyes and give them to Sasuke, he realizes that one of Itachi's eyes is blind and therefore useless. At least maybe we're not entirely sure if a blind eye can still be used to make an EMS. But Obito still needs Sasuke to unlock the EMS. And thus he goes to his Sharingan collection and pulls out Ugaku's eyes. And when Sasuke awakens from the surgery, he rages in the same way that he raged after getting Itachi's eyes, cutting his way through Obito's lair with his newly activated EMS Susana, until eventually he stumbles upon his brother, the person he's looking for, recovering in an adjacent laboratory room. Furiated merely by the sight of Itachi, Sasuke activates his Susano and is about to cut Itachi down. But before he can cut Itachi down, he sees that Itachi is crying. And as Itachi, with tears running down his face, looks into the eye of Sasuke, he says, Father, this time I will be the one 
to not fight back, which stops Sasuke directly in his tracks. This cold, unfeeling assassin has tears in his eyes for the father that he slayed. And at this point, Sasuke's memories of the night of the massacre come flooding back to him. And more specifically, he remembers seeing Itachi like this on the night of the massacre, standing on top of the pole, looking back at the clan that he just massacred, with tears running down his face. And it's at this moment that Sasuke realizes that something is wrong. But before Sasuke has time to collect his thoughts, Obito flies into the room and tries to kill Itachi. But Sasuke instinctually and without thinking protects Obito with his newly found Susano, whisking him away from Obito and bursting out of the lair. Sasuke then holding on to Itachi within the skeletal grip of his Susano, screams, why are you crying when you took everything from me? At which point Itachi reveals the reality of the situation to Sasuke. Sasuke, upon hearing this story, becomes furious and decides that he needs to corroborate it in the only way he knows how, by asking Donzo, who they find deep within the confines of the root. And when they corner him and ask him to corroborate the story that Itachi was telling Sasuke, Donzo confirms to Sasuke that what Itachi is telling him is entirely true. And it's at this point that Itachi and Sasuke battle side by side against Donzo and his army of root members, until eventually they're able to kill him and cripple enough of his root members that they're able to escape, after which they head to Konoha proper, where they speak with Tsunade, who hears the truth behind the story of the Uchiha massacre from Itachi, and is also warned about the movements of the Akatsuki by Itachi, who was a known spy to Hiruzen. Her predecessor, and therefore, since Itachi was a spy for Hiruzen, logic would dictate that his innocence would be known at a Hokage level. Itachi and Sasuke then rejoin the fold of Konoha and fight alongside Konoha in the upcoming war, which they basically end up doing anyways in the actual main timeline. And if you want to make it the super happy ending, you can say that Itachi snagged an extra Sharingan on his way out of Obito's lair. And after Itachi plays a significant role in the conclusion of the fourth great Shinobi World War, he eventually becomes the first ever Uchiha Hokage after Tsunade steps down. As the acknowledgement of what he did for the village on the night of the Uchiha massacre becomes knowledge to everybody and thus makes him the clearest choice the sixth Hokage. On top of this, with Itachi joining Konoha and informing them about all things Akatsuki, he would also be able to tell Konoha what he knew about Nagato and how Nagato's powers worked. And as a wielder of an MS who spent years alongside Nagato, he should fully understand how Nagato's abilities work, which would give Jiraiya the leg up in the subsequent battle against the Six Paths of Pain. As Nagato himself acknowledged the fact that if Jiraiya had any information about how his technique worked prior to their battle, Jiraiya would have won. And thus Jiraiya, who now has information on how Nagato Nagato's technique works, would inevitably win in his battle against the Six Paths of Pain in the Land of Rain. But before Jirai is to strike the killing blow on Nagato, he reaches out his hand instead and apologizes to Nagato, who he sees has been wronged time after time by both Konoha and the ninja world as a whole. He apologizes for abandoning him and tells him that it wasn't Konoha that killed Yahiko, but Donzo, who was recently killed for his wrongdoings by Sasuke and Itachi, who were welcomed back into the fold. And Jiraiya pleads with Nagato to see the error of his ways, as Jiraiya points to the decimated hidden rain, littered now with stories similar to Nagato's childhood, an orphan raised in a war zone whose parents were taken from him by forces they're too young to understand. And Jiraiya asked Nagato if a world filled with pain comparable to what Nagato went through as a child is a world that he wants to live in. And it's at this point that Nagato, who is very clearly shaky in his own ideology, considering the fact that Naruto was able to talk him out of it in like five minutes, takes Jiraiya's hand. And as he does, the rain stops in the village. The sun begins to peek through the clouds, and Conan joins their side. And the three of them take the body of the Devapath, or Yahiko, and bury him outside of the shack where Jiraiya trained the Ame orphans originally, with a tombstone that says Yahiko. Nagato and Conan then dedicate themselves to the betterment of the hidden rain, which has been their core value this entire time, and Jiraiya brings them into the diplomatic folds with Konoha, ensuring both their protection and continued existence. After Nagato's death, we had the death of Kisame. Kisame's core motivation was loyalty, and protecting those who meant something to him, which was unfortunate because Kisame was wronged by the worst iteration of the village that he loved. See, Kisame became a rogue ninja because he fell out of love with the Blood Mist Village, and more importantly, the way that they conducted themselves, which is eerily similar to the backstory of Zabza. However, because so many people were abandoning the Hidden Mist Village during this time period, the Hidden Mist would send Hunter Nin after whoever left. And thus, because the Hidden Mist Village sent Shinobi after Shinobi to kill Kisame, he sunk deeper and deeper into his evil, and also sunk deeper and deeper into his hatred of the Hidden Mist. See, Kisame truly 
really could have been the greatest thing that ever happened to the Hidden Mist. He was a blindly loyal, incredibly strong soldier who only wanted what was best for the village. And I genuinely believe, regardless of how many Hunter Nin he had to kill, Kisame never stopped loving the Land of Water. And thus, in Kisame's final battle against Mike Guy, instead of sicking his own sharks on himself, Kisame asks Mike Guy to bring him to the Land of Water, where he'll stand trial for his crimes. However, Kisame doesn't want to go there to be put on trial. Kisame just wants to see the land of water one last time before he sicks his sharks on himself. And thus, the second that Kisame gets to the land of water, he plans on ending his own life. And my guy grants him that wish. But when he finally gets to the land of water, he realizes it looks different. I, the fifth Mizukage, is in charge. There's children smiling and running around. There's tourists, there's new buildings. It's gorgeous. And Kisame is so taken aback by the sheer beauty of this new found hidden mist village that for a moment he forgets that he came there to end his own life. And in that brief moment, Mei comes up to him and says that she understands why he left, understands why he fell out of love with the corrupt system, and even understands why he killed Fuguki, the original wielder of Samehara, as Fuguki was the real traitor. And therefore she asks if he'll rejoin the Mist as the next head of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist and lead the Hidden Mist Village into a new era of clarity, honesty, in commitment to the land of water, to which Kisame says yes. Now after Kisame, we have another K member of the Akatsuki, Kona, who dies at the hands of Obito after Obito introduces inarguably the worst thing that was ever introduced into Naruto, Izanagi. Now Konan's perfect ending is rather simple. She lives on with Nagato in the Hidden Rain, modernizing it into a superpower alongside all the other hidden villages. It's simple, it's easy, it's exactly what you wanted. Which brings us to Obito. Obito's story is gonna be fairly similar to the story that he has in the main storyline. Obito realizes the error of his ways through the conversation that he has with Naruto. But instead of sacrificing his life for Naruto, Obito is actually the person who manifests the light blue shuriken-wielding Susano, the Susano that Kakashi awoke to later on in the story. However, Obito awakens the Susano as Kakia is firing her Ashaw killing bones at Naruto and Sasuke. And thus, through the power of this newly awakened Susano and his greatly heightened visual prowess power, Obito is able to either create a Kamui so large that it's able to catch both Ash All Killing Bone, or simply use the defensive prowess of the Susano to deflect one of the Ash All Killing Bones. And thus, Obito doesn't have to use his stomach to catch one of them. After saving Naruto and I guess Kakashi from this one hit kill move, Obito essentially fills in the role that Kakashi played in the battle against Kaguya. Well, Kakashi still plays a somewhat pivotal role in the battle against Kaguya, just minus the Susano. And by the end of the battle, Kaguya is sealed by Naruto and Sasuke, and Obito is still alive, and thus Obito returns to Konoha with Kakashi. And the two of them, now having remedied their issues, visit Rin's grave together. Which I think is a much better ending for Obito than Obito turning back into a child to run off with his childhood crush in the Pure Lands. It also makes a lot more sense than Obito passing his six pass chakra to Kakashi, and that somehow being Kakashi manifesting a dual MS that leads to a perfect Susano. Even though pretty much all conventional knowledge that we know about Susano says that you need an EMS, neither Obito nor Kakashi would have an EMS. And that's it. That's all the members of the Akatsuki. But Nick, what about Zetsu? What about him? You want to know Zetsu's happy ending? Being crushed to death in a moon-sized meteor gravity well alongside his mother. That's it. That's all. That's what you get for killing Madara. No happy ending for you. And with that, that is truly all the members of the Akatsuki. I understand Orochimaru at one point was a member of the Akatsuki, but if you don't think Orochimaru getting to do all the research that they're doing with the funding of Konoha nowadays isn't Orochimaru's happy ending, you're not paying attention. But what do you guys think? If you had to give each member of the Akatsuki a happy ending, what would it look like? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. I forgot how much I like writing what ifs because I enjoy writing and I don't get to write that much in this speaking profession.